Hello and welcome to I Know Dino. I'm Gary. And I'm Sabrina. And today in our 403rd episode, we have an interview with Oliver and Joshua. We have Dinosaur of the Day Spinops, and of course, a fun fact. But before we get into all of that, as always, we'd like to thank some of our patrons for helping to make our podcast a reality. And this week, we'd like to thank Sam Enchisaurus, Michael Raptor, Scott, JC, Scorpius Khan, Ben at Jurassic Site B, Arlosaurus, Robert, Sauropod Susan, and Danny Hermes. Love hearing the list of names each week. Thank you so much for being part of our dinosaur community. And now we're going to go on to our interview with Oliver and Joshua. But of course, if you are a patron, there is an extended version of this interview. So if you want to hear a longer form, then be sure to check out your premium content feed. We're joined this week by Oliver Vings, who is a geologist with a doctorate in vertebrate paleontology, and he is the curator of the Geosciences Collections and the Geiseltal Collection at the Martin Luther University Halle-Wittenberg in Germany, and Joshua Knupa, a paleo artist and host of PaleoStream on Twitch. The two of them created the graphic novel Europasaurus Life on Jurassic Islands which is amazing. And that's why we're talking to them today. Thank you both for joining us. Cool. Thank you very much for the invitation. Yes. So we thought this book was so cool. Even before we saw anything about it, we're like, oh, a graphic novel about dinosaurs. We have to, we have to know more. <laughs> How did you come up with the idea? Well, it was quite long in the making, I have to say. Um, I was working on a on a longer research project concerning Europosaurus and all the other animals and also plants from, from one specific locality we can talk about later, I guess. And at the end of this project, uh, we had the opportunity to apply for additional funding for public outreach, so to say, right? For, for bringing our results into the public and making everybody more exciting about uh, Europosaurus and our discoveries. and. I started with a traditional popular science book, so a lot of uh, text and a few nice pictures. And, and I asked the Volkswagen Foundation, so the VW Foundation, this is a, a foundation which got all its funding from, from shares from VW, I think 50 years ago, something mm-hmm. like that. And they fund a lot of science projects here in Germany. And they funded our project. And I, I asked them, can I make a popular science book? And they said, ah, well, this has to be very um, novel, a novel approach and not a popular science book. We have to make something different. And could you think something more exciting? And um, I thought, <laughs> yeah, maybe a graphic novel would be nice. But I was actually quite afraid to ask Joshua about it because Joshua actually made all the, the reconstruction of all the animals we, we already discovered at that quarry there. And I thought uh, a graphic novel would be such a tremendous amount of work <laughs> yeah. to do that, that he probably will decline because he has so many other exciting projects where he also can, can reconstruct extinct environments and ecosystems. I asked him, and uh, on the contrary, he was very enthusiastic about it, and he really wanted to start right in, and this was the start, actually. And I don't know, Joshua, um, looking back at it now, did you expect that it would take so long as we, as we I think it, it was three years in the making, our graphic novel, right? Especially because Joshua had to, to draw everything by hand. And and for one of these double pages, you see these nice panoramic views. Mm-hmm. He needed probably around a week or so, right? Yeah, at the at the beginning, it took me like two weeks. Towards the end, I got faster, and then it was just a just a week, basically. Oh, just a week! <laughs> <laughs> this is uh, it's quite amazing. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, no, it, it is. It's interesting because we basically met in the middle. I was rather enthusiastic about it because I already had something similar in mind beforehand. Mm. As Oliver said, I already had worked with several people from the dinosaur, uh, the Europosaurus project on publications and so on. I did something on, on tracks found at the site, a new little um, crocodile that was found there, Knirschgesuchus. And I, I was rather hyped about the locality overall. Because it's also such a nice cross section through that ecosystem there, and so I I actually asked uh, the scientific lead of the dinosaur park Münchenhagen where the fossils are prepared. Hey, could you imagine maybe publishing a book with that stuff at some point? 
I didn't have a graphic novel in mind. I had more something. I I, I had something very modest in mind, like like a little field guide mm. similar to these little books where you identify birds in stuff like that a little bit pseudo wildlife book like mm -hmm. and he was like ah not a bad idea but i, I don't know and uh, a few months or weeks later i i got word back from him it was like hey oliver when i wants to do a graphic novel <laughs> what do you think <laughs> and so we we met there and i was also first a little bit skeptical because it's a lot of work mm -hmm. yes But yeah, the, the longer we worked on it and the more the, the ideas came together, the more confident I especially became that, that we could do it. I think I hid a little bit my, my doubts away because <laughs> I had never done such a big project and I didn't want to encourage the rest of the team. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Anyhow, he, he was enthusiastic, at least... Uh... On the surface, towards me, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> on the surface, and and well, I I applied for the additional funding. We got the funding, uh, which actually funded a lot of Yosha's work, and also uh, we had an, another person in the team, uh, which was Henning Alas. He's an art director, and he worked on several comic movies, more or less, uh, here in, in Germany. And he was recommended by a friend of mine because. Uh, When Joshua and I started with the project, we soon realized we don't know really how to tell a story that it keeps exciting, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. How how to arrange everything on the picture. Um, we had something in mind, like this this journey of the small Europosaurus and so on, and the big ca catastrophe in the book. We all had that in mind already, but we didn't know how to connect all these these uh, singular events into a you know, constrained story. And and this is something which Henning did perfectly. Also, that he managed to open our eyes as well, right? For for how colors can influence what we feel and 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 how everything in the picture should be arranged, that it you know transports the message without being too obvious. This is something yeah. which we also learned in that project. Yeah, his mm -hmm. his expertise was was very important. And also that he beforehand never worked with dinosaurs mm -hmm. was was really good because mm -hmm. that way he had really the yep. um, eyes for for things we usually take for granted, yeah. uh, and and we with our 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 nerd stuff always coming <laughs> in and oh this would be so nice yeah. to tell yeah, and so to it's show so obvious, and, it's obvious that this and it's so oh it's, it's so obvious to us yeah. and he's <laughs> like but guys what are you talking about I don't <laughs> see that yeah. <laughs> yeah yeah so that was yeah. very helpful and and uh, we had another a few persons who were involved in the project um, especially the setting of the book was done by a colleague of mine in, in the university um, Arila. Pearl and and she did also quite a, a excellent job. Actually, that was one of the prerequisites to uh, get this cheap price, the, the final selling price. That we actually did everything ourselves, and we just gave the the, the final PDF to the publisher, and they just sent it over and and published it and wow. printed it. And and this this is something um, I think which turned out quite nice. And and also. The publisher sometimes wasn't quite happy in how we actually designed it. And he said, ah, it looks like a children's book. <laughs> uh, but I think it was the right way. And I would do it again. And also <laughs> all the, the, the fights for the publisher and say, Here, come on, <laughs> let's do it our way. Let's try it. Come on. <laughs> it will work. <laughs> yeah, it's certainly not a typical dinosaur book because it is a graphic novel, mm -hmm. but it is very... It's not even a typical graphic novel, though, because like you said, it's no, a lot no, of two-page spreads. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's It looks yeah. more like a, a paleo art book, but it has the text mm -hmm. to describe what's happening in it, and it follows a consistent story through it. I don't think I've quite seen that combination before. Yeah. 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 It's it's also, to our knowledge, the first of its kind. Yeah, but there will be more. Oh, good. <laughs> What we try to do is basically make it a, um, a documentary in book form. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah, it definitely has that feel, like a, sort of a visual book version of Walking with Dinosaurs or something like that. Exactly. Right. It's, yeah. I yeah. mean, it's yeah. stunning. And you, Big influence. you even turned it into a bit of an animated short film, right, on, on your YouTube True. channel. Yes, yes. That yeah. was another thing uh, which we came up later, actually, right? We didn't blend it from the start. Yeah, yeah. We, we, we thought, yeah, let's let's have maybe a little trailer with a little bit of animation in it and, and stuff like in, in our proposal. Yeah. 
and and towards the end we were like oh let's let's animate like half the book <laughs> or something yeah, yeah. and let's, and then let's we give it away for free because you know that is what we want to do yeah. with our science yeah, yeah. We because we we got know. our money out of it yeah. with with a uh, with the funding from the foundation so the sales of the book don't matter that much to us mm. mm-hmm. yeah um, okay. it's it's really the it's it's all about the outreach and yeah we we first thought about uh, actually hiring somebody to to make the um animations mm-hmm. and then we it went back and forth and at some point i was like okay i'm downloading after effects i'm learning <laughs> to animate now <laughs> and it worked uh, out yeah it, it was a crash course but it worked yeah, <laughs> yeah. And, and you see also uh, the evolution of his of joshua's capabilities right if you see the the first part and the, the fourth part uh, you see definitely um a difference and that there's much more animated towards the end mm-hmm. so mm. this is have a few responses where they okay it's the dinosaurs and dinosaurs are not cool anymore <laughs> but uh, usually people are happy with, with the way and and some approach me and tell me what we really had these animals here in germany i also I, yeah. uh, always thought they are just you know overseas in the us and and so on mm-hmm. and uh, this is this is something i think where people suddenly realize that these animals and uh, plants and the whole ecosystems we are right here where we are right and everywhere on earth right and yeah. you have these special ecosystems and this is something i really like that um it opens the eyes of some people at least yeah yeah yeah, yeah. that's that's also for me one of my um, most favorite things to do when when i do paleo art open the eyes to people about the hidden biodiversities right on their doorstep mm-hmm. so the the local prehistory, basically, that people can discover for for themselves if they just know where to look. Sometimes, because yeah. it, it it it's true. Yeah, everybody you say dinosaurs and everybody thinks T Rex and Brontosaurus <laughs> and stuff like that. But there's so much more, mm-hmm. um, not just in Germany, but also in in many other countries, mm-hmm. right in front of people, but they don't know about it. Because it's never really communicated. Yeah, that's true. If it doesn't really matter where you are. The popular TV shows tend to focus on T-Rex and, you know, because it's got the big teeth and whatever. And it's been in the pop culture for so long. But I think I really yeah. like that you guys picked Europasaurus. I think that it's, you know, its name means European. And, you know, the first part of it, at least, is like perfect yeah, well, for yeah. your audience too. Euro- Europa is, is the, the um, German pronunciation for Europe. Mm-hmm. Mm. Right, so yeah, it's European dinosaur, and uh, the name was actually, I think, mostly going back to to Octavio Mateo, so a Portuguese paleontologist mm. who was collaborating on the original description of Europasaurus, and the find itself was actually published in Nature back then, and because it is so special, right? Because mm-hmm. Europasaurus is a sauropod, so a member of the clade which had the largest animals ever walking on this planet right Mm -hmm. it still stayed tiny (laughs) it was so weird when it was found um, that everybody thought these were just juveniles right and Mm -hmm. it really turned out only with bone diagenesis so with the the growth rates and the growth marks on on, in, in bone thin sections that these were adults that they have been adults and and um still a maximum of eight meters in length, right? Or, or three meters in height. That's actually more more impressive. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but only really for the largest animals. So I think most of them are like like five or six meters. Oh wow! Mm-hmm. And they were yeah. fully grown. Yeah. So is it okay if we speak in, in meters in your? Oh in yes, yeah, that's or fine. Should we go to feet? I can translate. You know, under twenty feet. <laughs> I couldn't in, in imperial. So, <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Just compare it. If, if you look at the skeleton of Europasaurus, right, and and compare it with um, other sauropods, like we have in, in Berlin, the uh, largest original mounted skeleton is uh, formerly Brachiosaurus. It's now Giraffe Titan, right? So it's mm-hmm. a couple of years. And if you look at the skeleton, it looks almost identical. There's really, really tiny <laughs> differences. This specimen in, in Berlin, Giraffe Titan, is more than 13 meters high. So it, uh, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's much just, bigger. <laughs> uh, 10, 10, 10 meters more. It's like uh, a five-story building, something like that, right? So it's just yeah. weird. And really, from the skeleton, you it really looks like a juvenile. 
Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's it's funny. At some point, you also see it in the book at the end. At some point, the, the people in Berlin rented a, a Europasaurus mount. And put it yeah, next to actually, the rougher yeah, yeah. and it just <laughs> looks like a baby. I, I, I did that for for a TV production actually a couple of years back, and I, I still don't get it why they don't kept it there because it looks so perfect in the dinosaur hall in Berlin. But no, they uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm, I'm still well, trying to convince them. It should, <laughs> yeah. be, it should be there. It should be there. It should it should be. I mean, it's it's one of the largest museums uh, in Germany yeah. with a with a paleontology focus. So. It, should be yeah there. and it could be but also i think the, the name europosaurus fits so well because uh, when when you look at it also geographically it wonderfully ties together the the late jurassic faunas mm. um mm-hmm. of europe we, mm. we we wanted to do that even more actually in the book but we ran out of pages mm. to really tie it all together how all these 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 different faunas we find in in europe but also africa and north america how similar they are but also how different they are mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. yeah I like, too, how you're talking about the extra information at the back, because when I was first reading it and I was, you know, you've got your establishing scene of the crocodilian swimming through like the, you know, the ancient seas. And you say, you know, this is ancient Europe and or 154 million years ago, Europe. And you're looking at it and you're like, that looks nothing like Europe. I can't tell (laughs) what this is. And then at the end, you've got the nice little outline around that previous drawing. And it's like, okay, well, this is if you really want to know, you know, where it was in Europe, here's how you can see it. But in the actual book, in the beginning part of it, it's nice because it doesn't break you out of the story by giving you all this technical detail. You can just sort of enjoy the story part of it. And then at the end, when you're like, okay, now I want to actually learn yeah. the science if, if behind it. If you want to learn it, it, you have the opportunity, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. And, but you don't have to. That maybe don't uh, hit you with it right from the start. Yeah. Yeah. It's, um, when we planned the, the book, we did it without any explanation whatsoever. So even if you can't read, right, you can still check the pages, look at the images, and mm-hmm. you can follow the story. That was very important to us. Mm-hmm. And uh, only very late in the production process, we actually added these lines to give a little bit more background information and to make it for some readers maybe more interesting to to stay with us and, and don't, you know, put it aside the book. Yeah. Yeah. Or, or make certain things more obvious in, in case it's uh, it doesn't really come across. Like showing off the the mating behavior of crocodilians mm-hmm. it's so hard to do that without movement mm-hmm. you know like 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 the ripples on the water surface and everything in in the little animations that i did then later that 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 works but yeah. but doing that in static uh, images without any any descriptive text it's it's really difficult explanation yeah if, if you haven't seen that somewhere on a, uh, in a documentary then then you're lost, right? Mm -hmm. What is this? What's what's happening there? Yeah. So for this, um, the text was very useful, yeah. Yes, and I appreciate it's in German and English. Yeah, yeah. that was the other thing because we thought uh, we won't have an opportunity to actually publish it in English again, right? If you you separate it. So we thought right from the start, okay, we we do both languages. And and, uh, yeah, maybe eventually there will be other languages as well. I think there were some, some... interested companies from china and russia but at least one russian publisher jumped jumped back again because it was too gruesome for them oh (laughs) interesting which yeah which i don't think it is right we have we have a little bit of blood in there but i don't think it's like a i don't know i guess if they're like a children's book publisher they might depending which side they're coming from Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, and it's a, the funny thing is that uh, the feedback I got back from children is they they have no problem with all the blood and stuff. It's it's more the emotional stuff that happens in the mm. middle of the book mm-hmm. that's more problematic <laughs> for them. <laughs> yeah, I, I got the same response. Yeah, but uh, that yeah. uh, I know of a, of a little girl. With, uh, actually, this is not our intended age range, right? But all my friends, of course showed it to their kids as well. And I think the girl was four or so. And she was okay with, with that, that animals eat other animals, right? And they hunt them and, and all the blood. But she was um, very, very sad that the small dinosaur actually lost his parents. Mm-hmm. And this is understandable, I guess, right? Because especially if you can relate it to yourself and you don't want to lose you know, your, your closest family members. But it's, I don't know, it's, it's interesting because... Uh, I didn't think about this before I got this response. And uh, something uh, 
which also told me that we cannot think about or, or, or identify all possible reactions, right? This is something yeah. Yeah. which always Well, changes. the story, you know, for a good story, you do need to torture the characters, as they say. There's got to be a good second act with some drama. Mm-hmm. Can't be all happy. Exactly. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, well, it's a classic uh, hero's journey. Mm-hmm. Uh, underdog, which has to grow out of himself to actually develop, yep. uh, you know, to become strong and courageous. I like how it's it's so scientifically accurate, but you've also managed to convey emotions. Like I'm looking at one of the last pages and it looks happy to me. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, without them being uh, smiling and yeah. there's no dialogue yeah. and all that. Yeah, that is, that is something, um, that is, yeah. a Hen- we, Henning's we, part, I would say, right? Yeah, we, we had actually sometimes a little bit problems with that because mm-hmm. as a, just the, the way Europasaurus skulls are are constructed is is they, they have a kind of a natural smile to them. Mm. Mm-hmm. They they are a little bit like dolphins in that sense. <laughs> so so bringing uh, getting getting that smile away in the more serious or or sad moments was sometimes really difficult. Mm. Mm-hmm. Did you have any tricks you use? Like was that with lighting and coloration and stuff like that? Yeah, working with lighting and shadow, and and just a tiny bit uh, making making it from a lif- different perspective and, and stuff like that. Uh, it it helped a lot that I actually got a cast of of the skull of Europosaurus from the dinosaur park Munchhagen, so I could pose it in front of me and look at it from from all sides to to really internalize the anatomy. Towards the end of the project, I didn't even look at it anymore. <laughs> I, I just I, I I can draw Europosaurus without any reference. At, at the same <laughs> wow. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> and in terms of the story, I know some of it is kind of based on hypotheses, but a lot of it was also based on actual findings, right? At at dig sites. Mm, yeah. As much as possible. So the dig site itself, it's a large quarry which is active for 130 years, something like that right now. It's a large limestone quarry on the northern rim of the Harz Mountains in, in the middle of Germany. And um, yeah, it was quite a big surprise when, when the first Europosaurus bones turned out to be there because these are all marine limestones. And, and uh, obviously it has to be, uh, it had to be quite quite uh, shallow at that stage hmm. and probably like, like tidal flat deposits. But Europosaurus, has only been found in one specific layer. So the, the, the whole section is from the Oxfordian to the uh, Tithonian almost, so the whole Cambridgean, so more than a million years, right? Mm-hmm. And, and um, Europosaurus is really just in one tiny layer. The problem is also that the layers are not no longer horizontally bedded, but because of the uplift of the Harz Mountains, um, they were really dragged to a, a upright position and they're actually a little bit over tilted as well it's very hard to get access to these layers because uh, they don't take the the limestone out layer by layer but mm. they take out all layers at once or from the you know from the other side and just like a cake like uh, all, all these slices <laughs> and, and um in this specific layer where europasaurus has been found uh Again, the bones appear only every couple of years or so, and and uh, it, it seems they were likely enriched in in depressions in the ocean or in the tidal flat sediments, but maybe like water runoff areas. So it is very difficult. It's actually the most difficult quarry I ever worked, or the most uh, difficult dig site I ever worked, and I worked on almost all continents. Mm-hmm. In the time. This is something which. I was always um, thinking about how how can you get so many animals? We have not just one animal, right? We have uh, remains of 21 individuals, at least. At least. There's still a lot of material that has to be prepped. Wow. Yeah, and, and, and this is just, this is not the same age range. We have, we have these adults, right, with these uh, three meter high and, and eight meters long. But we also have very small juveniles, like almost babies, like, uh, I think, two feet long or so right and and, uh, and we have all the ontogenetic stages in the middle as well wow. so you, you it must have been a, a herd right and and you you must have been a process where they all died at once mm-hmm. otherwise it's not likely right that you actually get all the, the remains especially the young ones they they would probably have been eaten more than die mm-hmm. a natural cause right and and um 
yeah, I was thinking quite a lot about it. You know, it couldn't be that they have been drinking poisoned water or something like that. But but even then, right, uh, small ones are much weaker than fully grown adults and they would die earlier. So mm-hmm. you wouldn't actually find them together. So it must have been a very sudden event. Yeah. And and uh, yeah, the best idea is what we came up with was this this um, lightning storm and a lightning strike. Yeah, we really have examples today as well where you, you have uh, reindeer and, and uh, cows. I think almost every year you have a, a lightning strike and then a, a herd of cows uh, and they're, they're huddled together and then they just all killed. Yeah. It just mm-hmm. happens. Yeah. Yeah. And the, yeah. the long lightning rod neck of the sauropod sticking up into yeah. the sky. <laughs> yeah. That's mm-hmm. the other thing. That right? would yeah. also help with that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There was also the idea that it might have been something like, like a tsunami or something. Mm. But when you look at the geology, that's just not there. No. And also, you know, it wouldn't happen that they actually all wash together, except, well, if it's one, it's the only depression, <laughs> then of course everything would sink in there and if you had a tsunami then you would have other taxa there as well like mm. all the other dinosaurs which probably, which probably lived there now they lived there we, we know that they lived there right we have a lot of uh, theropod teeth and uh, we have one stegosaur tooth and uh, also other other animals there and and it's just curaposaurus right and, and, um, <laughs> Yeah, it's 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 a very weird thing. I still hope that we actually have the luck. Uh, we still monitor this quarry and we still um, look after all the the plastics things they do for uh, getting the the quarry the quarrying the the limestone. When I started my project, I, I talked to all the people who were involved in the original discovery back in uh, 1998. And uh, they said, oh, yeah, we, we, we just stopped at the quarry floor because um, it was difficult to go deeper, but there were bones everywhere. And you can go deeper and you can <laughs> find bones immediately. And this is what we did, actually. We started a large excavation. I had 20 students helping me back then, and um, we found nothing. And then I said, okay, we have to do more solid measures, and uh, we... We actually had some plastic activities there, so ex- explosives, which, I, which they usually also take or take the whole quarry wall, wall off. But but we actually were going down in the in the ground, deeper mm-hmm. in the ground, like three meters deep and on a length of, of 20 meters. And we didn't blast, of course, right the layer we want, but right next to it. Mm-hmm. And then I had a large cutter pillar and, and um, an excavator and a dump truck and and uh, they took out I, I calculated something like 600 metric tons or so wow. of stuff <laughs> and and uh, gave us access to this layer again right and then my 20 students we are digging in <laughs> and again well we found bones we found teeth but no europasaurus just mm. turtles and a little bit of crocodile stuff so all the marine animals were there but again this this europasaurus lens with the bones the bone bed was gone at that stage wow and this is quite yeah it's a story from the from the story it just happens all the time it's uh, difficult yeah and when you consider how long they have been growing there Mm. Just thinking about how many herds of yeah. Europasaurus might have been in there at some point. Mm. It grinds your gears. It's ah, <laughs> how many finds could have been made? Yeah, and, and we know, we know right now that actually, yeah, the, the, the first bones have not been discovered of Europasaurus have not been discovered in um, 98, but somewhere in the 70s, because we found in a, in a small collection uh, in the Hart Mountains in the Small Museum, we found some bones, and they have been wrongly labeled as marine reptile, but they were also sauropods, right? And um, so, yeah, if you think about it, and they, they, right now they make fertilizer out of it, there's probably a lot of dinosaur bones uh, ground up and ended up as fertilizer here. Oh. <laughs> mm can happen this is something you know on the other hand uh, if, if we didn't have the quarrying activity we didn't know something about this ecosystem at all right we, that's true we need, mm-hmm. we need really this uh, geologic activity and, and also commercial exploitation of, of quarries like that to actually make new finds yeah, i guess that's like so uh, the original iguanodon too mm-hmm. was uh was a quarry yeah. that really <laughs> then they found tons of iguanodon down there yeah yeah, yeah. Yeah, mine, like yeah. like big excavations of that size without any commercial activity beforehand are, are next to impossible. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. What would the Basically. point be? Let's dig a huge hole for no reason. Yeah, yeah. E- <laughs> even in even in uh, in in the US or something, you mm-hmm. you basically never have that. 
Yeah, only if they find like a T-Rex toe sticking out of the side of a cliff, then they might. (laughs) Then they might, yes, exactly. But never for the sauropods. No. No, no. (laughs) So just switching gears a little bit, uh, Yashua, you also, we mentioned you host the Paleo stream on Twitch. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, the Paleo stream is a series of live streams that happens every every weekend, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Schedule is on Twitch, and I'm live streaming my my process of of digital art. Um, mm-hmm. I started this around the time we began working on the Europosaurus graphic novel, mostly because I wanted to try that medium, because I wanted to get better at digital art, and because I realized that uh, the Europosaurus graphic novel would take so much of my time away that there would be very little for personal projects and to still be relevant um, in the in the online paleo art community i thought <laughs> hey that also gives me something to post you know and it, it grew from there from we, we started on on youtube and then after we had some some technical issues we switched over to to twitch and at the same time we uh, opened a discord server um mm. around the around the streams and yeah every, every friday for example the, we, we have a little bit of different formats every friday people can vote on on animals they they would like to draw we pick the four most liked and then um we have a timer of 20 minutes and in these 20 minutes everybody <laughs> can can draw their stuff and uh yeah and uh, and then it ends up uh, under the hashtag hello stream on on social media Nice. Fun. Yeah, that sounds really cool. Yeah. And so far, I, I have, I think, more than 2,100 uh, sketches. Oh, wow. my gosh. <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah, that is a lot. <laughs> <laughs> One last question for our listeners. If they want to find out more about uh, both of you and your work online, where are the best places to go? Probably Twitter, also Facebook. I'm also still on DeviantArt slowly beginning to ease into Instagram in the moment. Mm. Uh, and of course, there's a paleo stream Discord server. Yeah. I can be found there. Yeah. Joshua uh, is well better connected than I am. I, <laughs> say. Um, I guess if, if you want to, to learn about my research, you can go to ResearchGate. Most of my publications are there free to download. And, and uh, if they are not, just drop me a mail and I send it to you as well. It's... Yeah, and apart from that, uh, yeah, there are a few videos, I guess, on YouTube. Um, a couple of years ago, I, I uploaded some of the footage I, I did from with time lapse on my excavations. Oh, nice! So Ooh. you can have a look there. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Awesome. Well, thank you both so much for joining us. It was a real pleasure learning about the book and your other work as well. Yeah, you're very welcome. Thanks again, Oliver and Joshua, for the fantastic interview, and make sure to check out their book if you want to see some amazing paleo art of Europasaurus and lots of other really cool creatures. Mm -hmm. And now we're going to take a quick sponsor break, but when we come back, we'll get into our Dinosaur of the Day, Spinops. And now on to our Dinosaur of the Day, Spinops, which was a request from Crow via our Patreon and Discord, so thanks. Spinops was a centrosaurine ceratopsian that lived in the late Cretaceous in what is now Alberta, Canada. It was found in either the Oldman Formation or Dinosaur Park Formation. There's not the best records of where it was found. Spinops looked like other ceratopsians. It walked on all fours, it had a frill with horns on the frill, and it had brow horns and a beak and a nasal horn. Pretty triceratopsy. Yeah. Although horns on the frill isn't so triceratopsy. Well, true. It's similar to Styracosaurus and Centrosaurus, and it had the large nasal horn and small brown horns and that ornamentation on its frill. Okay, so yeah, more like Styracosaurus and Triceratops, a big nose horn, small brow horns. Yeah. Although a lot of Centrosaurus don't have any brow horns, so that makes it kind of special. And oh, a lot of fossils were found of Styracosaurus and Centrosaurus. So there's a whole growth series, and that made it really clear that Spinops is a unique, its own (laughs) genus. Trying to preempt the triceratops taurosaurus type (laughs) debate. Uh, This one didn't have the same kind of debate. 
So Spinops had a bony neck frill. It had two large spikes that stuck out of the back of the frill and two forward curving hooks near the middle of the frill. And it had this spiny appearance on the skulls. It was an herbivore. It weighed about two tons. The type species is Spinops sternbergorum. Charles Sternberg and his son Levi found the first fossils, two partial skulls in 1916 near Red Deer River, and sent them to the Natural History Museum in London. And that museum paid for their expedition. If you pay for the expedition, you get the fossils, I guess. Yes. <laughs> the holotype of Spinops includes a partial skull bone. There are also two referred specimens that include limb fragments and parts of the skull. Parts of the nasal horn, eye sockets, and small brow horns were also found. Now, none of these specimens were found articulated, but they were all found near each other in the same bone bed. Spinops was described in 2011 by Andrew Farkey and others. The genus name means spine face, and it refers to the unique ornamentation on its face. And maybe you already guessed the species name is in honor of Charles and Levi Sternberg. When the fossils were first found, they were considered to be too fragmentary, so they weren't prepared and put on display. Arthur Smith Woodward actually wrote to Charles Sternberg and said that the fossils were, quote, nothing but rubbish. Oh, harsh. Very harsh. A lot of those fragmentary ceratopsian frills at first don't look like much. They take a lot of interpretation and careful work to put them back together into the shape of a frill. Mm -hmm. And then even then, there's often really big pieces missing. So unless you really know what you're looking at, it can be hard to recreate it into something useful and nice looking. One of the hardest puzzles. Yeah, definitely. Now, Farkey said that he first saw the specimen in 2004 when he was in the UK for the filming of The Truth About Killer Dinosaurs. <laughs> <laughs> and the frill grabbed his attention. He told Michael Ryan about it, and Michael Ryan had tried to find the specimen in the Natural History Museum collections a few years back, but didn't see it. Apparently, Phil Curry had taken a photo of it sometime in the 1980s, so people knew it existed. <laughs> Just couldn't find it in the vast collections. Yeah. Now, based on letters between Charles Sternberg and staff at the Natural History Museum, the bone bed where the spinot fossils were found was really dense. So work is being done to relocate where those fossils were found based on documentation and fossil pollen from the rock where it was preserved. Oh, that's cool. Mm -hmm. Sounds like a useful one to find if it's full of tons of fossils. Yeah, you know there's going to be a, a huge bone bed. and Although, think of all those frill pieces you got to put together. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the paper describing spine ops ends with some questions like, do the ceratopsians preserved here document... Anagenesis or cladogenesis? How are the taxa of Alberta related to those from elsewhere? Was Spinops a rare element of the Campanian fauna, or will more remains be recognized? Which are all good questions that could probably be well answered if you find that bone bed. Well, the anagenesis one is always hard to answer because that relates to if something directly evolved into it or from it. Oh, true. And that's really hard to prove. But the rest of it, yeah. Yeah, I was thinking about how it's related to other rel to its relatives, and was it rare or was it common in its habitat? Now, other dinosaurs that lived around the same time and place as Spinops include the Ankylosaurs, Dioplosaurus, and Euoplocephalus, the Nodosaur Edmontonia, Ceratopsids like Chasmosaurus and Mercury Ceratops, and Hadrosaurs such as Corythosaurus and Parasaurolophus, and other animals that lived around the same time and place included crocodilians, lizards, plesiosaurs, pterosaurs, turtles, fish, and mammals. And for our fun fact, Europasaurus, the star of the graphic novel we were talking about in our interview, is another example of a dwarf dinosaur that lived in what is now Europe. And we've talked a lot about dwarf dinosaurs in Europe in episode 400, mostly about the ones on the Hatseg Island in what is now Romania. Europasaurus lived in the late Jurassic in what is now northern Germany, and at the time Europe was a bunch of small islands. This sauropod was small for a sauropod. It was about 20 feet or 6.2 meters long as an adult and weighed about 1,800 pounds or 800 kilograms. That is small for a sauropod. Yeah. I love how much range sauropods have. Mm-hmm. 
Now, originally, Europosaurus specimens were thought to be juveniles, but the discovery of so many fossils in 2006 led to a new study where researchers did histology and found that, yes, they're small specimens, but they're adults. The idea is that Europosaurus was patamorphic, meaning it had some features that you see in earlier relatives that are also seen in embryos and juvenile sauropod relatives. So it basically stays a little bit childish its whole life, yeah. genetically speaking. Exactly. Or, yeah, it looks that way. It also grew at a slower rate to other sauropods compared to, say, Camarasaurus. And together, these things are what made Europosaurus a dwarf dinosaur. And a little cutie. <laughs> yeah. And that wraps up this episode of Ino Dino. If you'd like to see all the links from our interview, as well as the description of our dinosaur of the day, then head over to our website, inodino.com. Thanks again, and until next time. Good day.